Harbor View Community Church. Yes, it's Christmas, and uh, sitting here in a living room, and well decorated, and I trust that your living rooms are, are uh, somewhat similar, uh, if not even more. Some people really get into this time of year, and so welcome, and best of the season to you. We are in Advent, and for the church calendar, this is such an important time of the year, let alone for this 2020 year, which we're coming to the end of. And uh, quite a few of you, I'm sure, are cheering the completion of this year. It'll go down in human history as uh, one for the books. And for a lot of us, say that, hey, I survived 2020. But more importantly, is that this is a year of all years where the focus of the Advent themes becomes so important and something that we need to integrate into our style, into our very lifestyle, particularly this year. And so welcome to church. Welcome to Harborview's online presence. Advent, last week we celebrated the, the Advent of hope. And that's just more than wishful thinking. It's the assurance that we have of a Christ who came, a Christ who lived amongst us, a Christ who sacrificed himself for us and rose again and conquered death so that we may celebrate what we have this week, and that is the Advent of peace. Because if we know Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus, then we know peace. But if we have no Jesus, N-O Jesus, then we have no peace, N-O peace. And so it falls into place as we look at the past scriptures and the prophets of leading into the wonderful arrival, the anticipation of that, which is Advent in itself. We go back to Isaiah, for example, and we read what was written to the people of Israel and, and for us today, that the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will emerge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you. And as people rejoice at the harvest, and like warriors dividing the plunder, for you will break the yoke of the slavery and lift the heavy burdens from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniform bloodstained by war will all be burned, and they will be fuel for, for the fire. And then we land on the verse that we know so well, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will be a rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called in these wonderful names, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven armies will make this happen. Welcome to the advent of peace. Let me pray for us as we start. And so God, I give you thanks for the scriptures that go back to thousands of years of the prophetic statements that brought hope and that growing anticipation of, of, of a peace that will come through the child that was born. And Lord, we live on the other side of that looking back now, but anticipation and the arrival of the King of Kings, Jesus again, to take over victory of this world and bring that peace that we ultimately want. And so Lord, I pray as we worship and meet in our places this morning, that you would fill our hearts with joy, that you'd fill our hearts with increased uh, presence of peace, and of hope, and ultimately capped because of your incredible love for us. And we give you thanks for all of this. Guide us in our worship. Be the teacher this morning in Christ's name. Amen.
have announcements, and there's not a lot this year. Uh, announcements is simply, if you didn't miss it, that today was supposed to be the Celebration of Lights Parade. And, uh, of course, that has been pushed off until next year now because of the new COVID protocols. But let me make another announcement for you that, uh, that comes from the book of, uh, of Luke. And it was the announcement or the pronouncement of the birth of Jesus to those shepherds that were in the, the fields at night. And it says here in, in chapter 2 of Luke, that night, that particular glorious evening, when, a, when shepherds were staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. You can imagine yourself being in that, that evening plain, watching this terrestrial uh, choirs of angels singing. And the angel assured to the shepherds, don't be afraid. What a great message. Do not be afraid. The angel said it. It was one thing that was repeated over and over again by Jesus. And also the words, peace to you. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news. That will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, in the city of David, and you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find him wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And then suddenly, Luke says, the angel was joined by a vast host of others of heaven's armies, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth on those with whom God is pleased. What a great announcement. Let's worship together this morning.
peace. This desired yet elusive ideal is not found in politics, the news, social media, addictions, or shallow relationships. Peace is only found through Jesus Christ. When we are at peace with God, then God's peace may be in us. In O Holy Night by Adolf Adam, there is a line that depicts the peace of God as a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. It's a breath of crisp mountain air, a sublime sunset, a breakthrough on a difficult project, or a baby's first cry after a hard night of labor. It's peace, a peace that settles deep into the bones and stills an anxious soul. Today marks the second week of Advent, a season recognized by the church around the world as a time to prepare our hearts and lives to welcome the coming of Jesus Christ at Christmas. We track this season by engaging in several rhythms, one of them being to light candles, one for each week leading up to Christmas Day. Today we light the second candle, traditionally called the candle of peace. Old Testament prophecies in the Bible were written for their immediate context. But some of these prophecies were also a foreshadow to Jesus. At Christmas, we read these prophecies to remind us of who Jesus is and why Jesus came to us at Christmas. Isaiah 9-6 is a popular scripture used in Advent. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus came as a child born to us with the eternal government of heaven on his shoulders as his, his responsibility. Jesus in, is in charge. Where Jesus rules, there is peace. Like a legend of old, Jesus rules with authority and power and treats those who live in the kingdom of Christ with kindness and honor. As Micah 5, 4 to 5a says, he will send out, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and he will be our peace. Please pray with me. Jesus, our peace. Be near to us when our lives seem far from peaceful. Assure us of your presence with us. We need you, Holy Spirit, and we cry out for, to you for help. Be our gentle shepherd, our wise king, and the peace of our hearts, we pray. Amen. This year at Christmas, as we near the end of 2020, we are celebrating at Harbor View with the theme that is so appropriate, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. A great line from that song, that Christmas song that is uh, endeared by many, Oh Holy Night. And uh, boy, we could sure use a thrill of hope because we are weary and we're looking forward to the conclusion of 2020 with, with hope, a true, divine, true hope that... Uh, 2021 will be will be much uh, more relaxed than what we've had to go through with 2020. So thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we are into Advent, the second week. We looked at the word hope last week, and it's more than just wishful thinking, but it's that deep understanding and expectation that God is with us. Emmanuel is there. Hope is born in Jesus Christ. And this week we're looking at peace. And peace has always been associated with Christmas, hasn't it? P-E-A-C-E, -E, that five-letter word that so many of us are chasing after. And um, such was the case on Christmas Eve as well and Christmas Day back in the year 1914. I know many of you weren't born. Probably your parents weren't even born at that point in time. But you'll recognize the year if you know your history as being entrenched, the year that the world was entrenched in World War I. And the German troops and the Allied troops actually participated in a Christmas truce in the middle of that war. And though versions aren't exactly uh, sure of what happened, and some are a little bit sketchy, but there's a common thread in most of the accounts that, uh, that peace took place for a short amount of time. 
And it happened in the name of Christmas. German and Allied troops sang carols together. They actually exchanged gifts, and one, even more than one account actually records that they had a friendly game of soccer during that time. And we long for peace, peace with our past, peace with our, 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 ourselves and with others, and peace with God. And Isaiah promised, as we read earlier, that the Messiah would be the Prince of Peace. And the angel sang, of course, and Jesus declared that in him was peace. And we recognize in the New Testament that Paul, throughout his scriptures, counseled that to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. But best of all, Jesus wants to bring peace in our lives, even now. And so, Lord, you're the Prince of Peace. We ask, Lord, in this time that we've had and our thoughts have been gathered and we've had an Advent reading and we've sung some carols and we're grateful for, for the rich uh, treasures that are found in, in Messiah. And I pray, Father, that you would land what needs to be uh, landed upon and where we need to go with this morning's teach and may the peace of Christ reign and rule in our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. In Luke 2, uh, we read earlier, 8 to 14, it's the shepherd's story. And they're out on the plains outside of Bethlehem, the place where it was prophesied that Christ would be born. And although he came in such uh, mean estate, as one carol puts it, born into this world in the, the back behind an inn in what is known as the, you know, the cave or the, the barn. And in that field that night, it was recognized as the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest, and peace towards all whom God's favor rests. And I noticed that this introductory statement of peace is tied to the coming of Messiah into the world. And with this announcement comes this incredible encouragement not to be afraid, but the response that the angels was give is, is one of joy. And I recognize as the angels sang their song, and I would love to have witnessed that. It's too bad they didn't have their iPhone or Samsung available to record that incredible encounter with them. But glory to God in the highest, in the highest heaven and peace. And it's interesting that peace is always connected to God's glory and His grace. Glory to God and peace. And isn't it interesting because the more you reflect upon God's glory, and who he was, and what took place with the incarnation, God becoming man and dwelling amongst us, living amongst us, that that, in essence, as we focus upon that, what incredible sense of peace that will bring. And this amount is, this, this announcement is just spectacular. And so I want to jump into a couple of chapters in, in John this morning as well and uh, look at a few verses, and I want to tie the theme of peace together and the affirmations of what Jesus said concerning peace, but while he was alive and with his disciples, and the assurance of that peace after his resurrection, and then we're going to land on, on a few uh, uh, take-homes this morning. So what about Jesus when he was amongst us? What did he say? What did he talk about peace? We want to go to the author of peace, right? In John 14 in the context of John 14, 15, 16, 17, those verses in John are uh, Jesus' last moments with the disciples before he was arrested, persecuted, crucified. And there are some incredible teaching in there. In John 14, 27, Jesus leaves his disciples with, this, with these words, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give it to you as the world gives. I don't give it to you of what everyone's trying to strive after with this idea of environmental or circumstantial peace. But he says, your heart must not be troubled or be fearful. And I love that. If Christ gives peace, then what comes with that is a heart that's not troubled or fearful. And then later on in chapter 16, 33, Jesus says, I've told you these things. And he's already given them a lot of backdrop so that in me, what? you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. That's what he declares. Jesus wasn't ignorant about that. He wasn't here to give us a, a, a comfy bed of roses. 
But he said, be courageous. Why? Because he's conquered the world. I've told you these things so that in me you will have peace. You will have suffering in this world. But be courageous. Be bold. I have conquered the world. Great words from our Savior. And his peace is contrasted to the problems that we will face in this world. And I notice that in this passage, which comes near, as I mentioned, the end of Jesus' life, as he's preparing his disciples for some significant problems and significant loss. That is the loss of himself, physically, his death. And so in this, Jesus communicates quite a few, uh, quite a few things I just want to leave with you. And one of them is he's leaving his peace with them. He says, my peace I give to you. So that even though they will no longer see him in the sense of what they were used to, he intends for them to have his peace. And the peace that he is offering is not just any peace. It's actually his peace. And I think that's important. It's like opening up the box of chocolates and picking out the one that's his. This is the, this is the goods. This is the real thing. And it's the same peace that accompanies Jesus in those... The, in those final agonizing moments of his life, the peace that he received during that time is exactly what he is passing on to his disciples. I find that very profound. That what Jesus experienced, although agonizing in those final moments, even, even as he was being arrested, even before, he knew what was happening, and he said to this is the peace I'm going to give you. Even though I'm going to be going through all of this, these trials and persecution, and finally my ultimate death, I'm leaving you with the same peace. And that was incredible source for the disciples, I'm sure, as they pressed on into their ministry. And I love it that Jesus doesn't uh, just cookie coat or sugar coat the uh, existence of human life on the planet. That you will have problems. That peace is not the absence of problems, is it? But he acknowledged that you're going to have unpleasant events in your life. But he also gave the encouragement, hey, I've overcome the world. That amidst all the concerns and worries and, and stresses and anxieties and losses of your life, in the middle of it, just like you can have a deep sense of joy, you may not be happy, but there's an over underlying sense of joy, there's an underlying sense of peace that God has taken care of it all. He's conquered. My daughter was asking me about something the other day that was on her mind. And uh, she brought it up, and I, I was able to sit in front of her. And I was able to look her into the eyes, and I said, Sweetheart, can you just rest in the fact that your daddy's got that under control? Your father's got this under control. And she was able to go, yeah, that's fine. And isn't it great that we have a father who's got it under control? He's already conquered the world. And so in John 20, later on, after Jesus is his death and his resurrection and, and in verses 19, 21, and 26, he uses these wonderful words, peace to you. And it was always in a connection to an invitation. As Jesus approached his various disciples and some of them for the first time seeing him, the first thing he offers them is this peace to you. I invite you into this peace. And I can imagine that there's some of you out there today who just are saying, I just want peace. I want peace from my past. I want security and peace for my tomorrow. I want peace in my home. I want peace with my God. Good news is peace was the announcement of Jesus on the night of his birth. And it was the promise of Jesus before his death. And I think as we've attempted just briefly to look at a, a variety of these passages in, in John. That uh, if I was to summarize the various uh, portions of the New Testament that talk about peace, I think it would be go this way. And I just want to leave you with these as we, as we look to close. First of all, peace is not the absence of pain. I know, difficult to imagine. But so important for us to remember. Jesus had pain. He knew the pain of rejection. He knew the pain of the cross and death. He knew the pain of his anticipating death. And he anticipated the pain of his disciples as well. And you know what? He knows your pain. He knows your pain. He knows what it's like to, to walk through the, the valley of the shadow of death. And that is why he accompanies us in the midst of our pain. 
And again, why he said, in this world you're going to be out of trouble, but don't worry, I'm with you. I got this. Your daddy's got this. He knows our pain. So peace is not the absence of pain, and peace is not the absence of problems either. <laughs> Sometimes pain is, is a problem as well. But Jesus foreshadowed those problems, and he announces the problems. In this world, you will have grief. You will have grief. So peace is not the absence of pain or the absence of problems. But here's the assurance. Peace is a person. And this is so important. This is so profound. Because the idea of peace in a person comes from John 14, these chapters we've been looking at, 14 to 16, in several ways. First of all, if peace is a person, Jesus declared about himself, what did he say? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. What are these dealing with? Well, he's talking about eternity. He's talking about salvation and the gift of eternal life. And I'm convinced that we will never arrive at peace about this life. But where we're at right now, in your context, I'm, I'm assured of this, until we have peace and understanding about our future and about what eternal life is. But if you can rest in the fact that the child that was born, that that the government who is upon his shoulders and the peace that comes through Jesus Christ and that it e equates to salvation, then that also equates on this side of heaven, peace right here and now. Peace is a person. Peace is Jesus. And secondly, I think the idea of this idea of peace as a person, it's communicated in the role of him as comforter. Because out throughout John, he wanted the disciples to be comforted and to know that he was always with them and that the Holy Spirit would actually provide this. Let's not neglect this. Because if peace is in him and he is here, then we can have peace in relationship with him and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. He's present. Not only he knows our problems, he's actually given us the promise of his presence. Ah, oh, that's good. I think that's really good. So where do we go with this? How do we land with that? Because here's the bottom line. You can search for peace for a lot of things. And you just have to look around our world and you can recognize people uh, frantically searching for peace. In how? In relationships? Um, perhaps the idea of, of peace would come if I just had enough finances. Or if I didn't have this problem in my life, which often equates to circumstances or a particular person. But only one thing brings peace. And that is a real person in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why he came. That's why he arrived in such humble estate. And so what? How do we activate it? How do we continue to have this effective in our lives? Well, I want to leave you with just real, three real things that I want you to, to deposit into you right now. And that is the three T's. Trust, talk, and turn. If there's anything you want to remember, just remember these. Trust, talk, and turn. We've got to trust Him for everything, including what? Our eternal destiny. We recognize that in Christ, if you um, are a friend of Jesus, in the sense that you recognize Him as your Lord and Savior, that He is the Savior of the world, then there's that idea of trust and that I have what I need for now, everything for life and godliness, it says in Peter, and everything I need for the future, my eternal salvation. So we've got to trust him. We've got to take him at his word. If Jesus said it, hey, I believe it. Secondly, we've got to talk to him about everything. Um, Philippians uh, 4, 6 says what? Don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, talking with God, let your requests be known to him. And he says this, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Great passage of scripture. If there's something you want to put to memory, a scripture this week, look at Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. Memorize that. It has been a lifeline for me. It will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So trust him. Talk to him always. And lastly, we turn to him. And that's where it comes back to that announcement of the angels so long ago. Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on peace to people on whom his favor rests. And uh, it says, reflecting on this, I think about the hymn, that old hymn. Some of you will know it. 
And I'll conclude with this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full at his wonderful face. And the things of earth, and there are lots around us, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Peace to you. star of Bethlehem, the Word of God has become flesh. Unto us a child is born, the Savior of this broken world. Oh, He Thank you for joining us this morning with our church online time together. I trust your heart's been encouraged as we looked at this advent of peace. And uh, before we uh, finish off, um, just as we conclude, there'll be some questions that will come up on the screen, some reflective questions for you as an individual or family to, to dialogue about. They're not necessarily deep and theological, but just to drive home the point. And so I, I we would invite you to take the, the time to, uh, to entertain these and allow it to go a little bit deeper. So receive from the Word of God the benediction this morning out of Romans 15. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Go this morning under that power and recognize that you are a double blessed people.